you may or may not have heard the saying, failing to plan is like planning to fail. But what if your plan sucks? If you've never finished your basement before, there are so many things you do not know what to plan for. As a contractor, my job was not just to execute the work, but manage the project, manage the trades and the materials and all these things. And I have that experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the step-by-step pre-construction process to help you have a smoother project. Notice I said smoother, not smooth, because there are oftentimes going to be things where you look up and you go, man, I didn't think about that. Where did I put the hose bib shut off? You got to remember to mark where the hose bib shut off is before you go hang in drywall. Otherwise, you're going hunting for this thing later. Now, I've kind of come out of semi-retirement. I'm, I would call myself maybe a part-time contractor right now. I've done a couple of basements with the idea of this channel in mind, trying to create more content for people to take in and help them finish their basements. Because I think with the cost of everything, labor, materials, DIY is a real reality for everyone if you want to finish your basement. So we're going to do a step-by-step walkthrough of my pre-construction process as a contractor. Create almost like a checklist. So before you get going, you're going to have as many things lined up as possible so that you can just work and get everything done and take your time and be as confident as possible that all the details around it are taken care of. Step one of every pre-construction process for me is the site visit. More than likely, I've gotten on the phone with the client to figure out if they are aligned with what I'm trying to do, and I've scheduled a time for me to go by and look at things. Now, over the years, I've learned a way of doing things. It's kind of like my own system It's often time in my head and it's all swirling around and I'm walking around the basements, taking notes, talking to a client and looking for specific things. Now, I'm going to try to organize all of those using my notes here so that you can get the best of what I have done in the past. Now, in no specific order, when I start walking through the basement, probably the first thing I'm thinking is, how am I getting materials in? Am I walking these down the stairs through the house in, and so I'm going to have to cover floors and protect things? Or can I fit most of the stuff through the window? Is there a big enough window for me to get drywall through? Or is this a walkout basement and we can just simply go through the backyard and just hand bomb all the materials in and not have to worry about going through the house or keeping anything clean? Number two is usually the biggest consideration is bulkheads. Where are the beams? Where is the duct work? Where are my potential rooms and doors? What hiccups am I going to run into? How big are these bulkheads? How tall? What's my ceiling height? Those are all swirling around in my head. So I'm going to be walking around as I'm doing this. And if the client has a floor plan, that's great. But while I'm walking around, I'm going to be making a floor plan, taking measures, chit-chatting with the client, asking them things they want. I'm going to note, is there stairwell work? In a lot of houses that I've finished, the stairwell from the main floor to the basement is not finished. The back of the stairs leading to the second floor is often exposed. So I have to back frame that. Is there enough space between the stringer and the framing for me to slide drywall? What are the landing situations? That kind of stuff. And as I'm looking at the stairwell, if there's turns, am I going to be able to get drywall around these turns is this consideration. How far apart are the ceiling joists? Are we going to be using resilient channel? What about soundproofing insulation? If it's 12 inches on center, I'm going to be running resilient channel and then I'm going to have to cut all the soundproofing in half if I'm getting 24 inch wide bats and tucking that in. I'm taking that into consideration because that is going to be more work. Are there signs of moisture is another one. What about efflorescence? Is there efflorescence on the floor or the walls? Is there moisture within the vapor barrier? One of the things that's hard for me to quantify in talking to somebody who doesn't do this is typically you can walk downstairs and I can taste how wet it is, right? Questions I will ask is, do you have a sump pump? How often does the sump pump go? Do you have a dehumidifier? Do you use it? 
How often are you emptying it? Little questions I'm asking along the way. Next would be bathroom. Do you have an existing bathroom rough in or are we smashing up the floor and putting one in? Where is the rough in? Do you want to move it? Is the shower drain in a terrible place? I've had bathroom rough ins where the shower drain is almost literally underneath the furnace. So we're smashing it up no matter what. We can't finish that. That's just a mess. Next, we're going to be talking about water shutoffs, you know, your exterior hose bibs. Where are they? What are we going to have to do with them? Can we relocate them to the utility room? Is that something the client wants to do to pay for? You know, it's a few hundred bucks, but it just makes it easier in that later on, I don't have to have an access panel on my ceiling. I can just go to my utility room. Typically, I have two hose bibs, and I'm going to turn off both of them, bleed them. See you later for the winter. Are there HVAC needs? Okay. What about heat runs? Are we dropping them to the floor? Does the bathroom have a heat run? Does the bathroom have a bathroom fan vented already? What else are we looking at? Where's the return air? Where can I put that? Are we dropping that to the floor? You know, where's the thermostat or the furnace switch? Because oftentimes they'll put the furnace switch in the room. And the last thing you want by accident is somebody to come down the stairs and turn off your furnace instead of turning on the lights. Not your favorite thing. Windows. A lot of basement windows from a certain era, especially recently, do not have window returns. You know, the little piece of wood that comes out that you attach your trim to. So you have to fabricate the window returns and then trim around it. Are you going to be adding a window? You know, how much materials am I going to need for building out the windows? That's another thing. Posts, structural posts. Typically, you're not going to move those because that's a lot of money. How are you going to cap them? Are we drywalling them? Are we capping them in trim? What's that plan? Lighting. How many lighting areas are you going to have? In a lot of basements that I've done, we're putting one TV area on a dimmer switch. Then there's a hallway on a three-way the bedroom will have a light fixture. The bathrooms will have a pot light in the shower or tub area and a vanity light. Very simple, but I want to go over that with them. Uh, do you want a gas fireplace or not? Do you want an electric fireplace or not? Are we, in terms of doors and trim, matching upstairs or are you doing something different? What about door handles and then paint colors? Most likely gray. If you want to do multiple colors, that's going to increase your cost because it's faster to paint the room, all the rooms the same color than it is to paint each room a different color and then you're at more material costs and so forth. All depends on your budget. Totally up to you. Those are the things I'm doing as I'm walking around and probably making a floor plan and measuring and talking to the client and getting a feel for them as I'm going along the way. So for you, as you're walking around your basement, those are little things you're going to look at because you're going to spend a lot of time looking up and taking notes on. When I was walking around, I was thinking of how am I getting materials in? So that's a category we call logistics. I am not young anymore. I am 47, not 27. So I got to think about how often I'm going to be going up and down stairs and bending over and picking things up. You'll be surprised just how much time you spend on the floor. Not because you fell down, but because everything requires you to get down and up. Maybe not everything, but putting in baseboards, hanging doors, subfloor, framing, putting in bottom plates, drywall, mixing stuff. You're going to be on the floor a lot. So you want to try to minimize the amount of physical exertion you're going through to get this done. Taking that into account, I am no longer a contractor. I'm more of a part-time contractor, we'll say. Even that isn't really what I do. I don't know what I do yet. I'm still trying to figure that out as I grow up. But I don't have a truck anymore. So another logistical item I have to think about is how I'm going to get materials and tools and stuff like that back and forth from a site. And I thought, well, most people don't have a pickup truck, right? I have a dad wagon Dodge Caravan. I can get a lot of stuff in there, but if I'm going to the dump in that and picking up materials and putting my tools in, my kids are going to be covered in drywall dust. I mean, they are now, and I hate it. I hate using my van as tools, and I'd love to get a truck, but that's another story for another time. So that's something I had to factor in. 
before when I wanted to go to the dump, I just showed up in the truck, throw the bags in the back and go to the dump. What I did for these two projects that I've kind of done is I've rented a U-Haul. I budgeted about a hundred bucks. I go rent the truck. I book it. I will throw, I'll, I'll put all the garbage in bags that I have from each subtask and then go to the dump. So the challenge you have with doing a basement is you can't just have all your materials show up. You can't have all your subfloor and framing show up and all the drywall because you got to play the subfloor before you frame and you got to frame before you do the drywall and otherwise you'll have no room to work. So another element of logistics is thinking, okay, where are my tools going to live throughout this project? When I have these materials delivered, where are they going to go? What's the best location? I say, for example, with subfloor, I like to show up, lay like 20 pieces of it, and then put all my tools, the leftover subfloor on that, the framing on that, and then now I can lay the rest of the floor and I can then get the tools together, frame up the walls, and now I'm not going backwards moving things over and over again. So any stage I'm at and I'm thinking about, I'm going to load all of these in. Okay, where are they going to go? I'm going to start over there. So I don't want to lay all, if I'm doing flooring, I don't want to lay every single box where I'm going to start. I want to lay a few boxes there and put them down and have the other boxes somewhere else and bring them along as I go, you know. Just planning that little bit ahead to save you the amount of times you're going to bend over and move stuff and be tired because being tired is part of this, especially if you've never done it before. Going to the dump, that's something to take into account. How are you going to get rid of the scrap materials? You're going to throw them in bags and try to put them in your garbage can? What, what are you going to do? Something to think about. I personally like going to the dump. It's a fun place, but that's for me. Another part of the site visit we talked about was doing a floor plan as I'm doing my walk around. I want to take all those little details that I talked about and put them on a piece of paper or on my computer file that I'm using floorplanner.com for, which is free. No, no one is paying me to put that up. It's just free. If you have another option to use for making a floor plan digitally, awesome, because you're going to need that floor plan for other phases and we're going to get to that. I want to take, as I said, all those notes, posts, shutoffs, windows, heat run location, and I want to barf all that information onto my floor plan as best I can so that I have as much detail going forward and I don't miss anything. If you miss something, don't beat yourself up. You're going to. You've never done this before. But do your best to, to get that done. Don't overthink it and keep moving. You're going to have hiccups. You want to keep moving in this process. So if you want to know how to make a floor plan, I have a video about that. You can go check that out. Uh, two videos, actually. We'll link those. You can go check those out. That floor plan is really going to come in handy when you need to do other things like calculating materials. As a contractor, I subcontract a certain amount of work. I subtract the painting, subcontract the drywall, the trim work. I mainly, at this stage, only want to do the subfloor and the framing. And if people wanted to hire me for that, I'd be like, A-OK. -okay. I don't mind doing those things. But I still need to know, in terms of budget costs and using my experience, the average square footage or how much surface area we need or flooring and all of that. So I can put together a budgetary guideline. But at the same time, for the things I need, I need to calculate materials. I don't want you to get worked up here. We're going to do a real quick overview. Calculating materials is essentially middle school math. It's surface area. It's linear feet. It's units or pieces, right? Because, and what I mean by pieces is you don't have square feet of toilet. You're buying a toilet. You don't have linear feet of door. You're buying one, two, three, four, five doors, things like that. Square footage is going to apply to your floor, your subfloor, your paint. You calculate how much paint you need based on the surface area you need to cover. Drywall, you know, uh, insulation, if you're doing that, soundproofing insulation. So whatever your floor square footage, well, guess what? Your ceiling is just the opposite of that. It's a mirror. So you, you, they all kind of work together. And I'll do something separate later, but this is just a brief 
snapshot of calculating materials. Okay, linear feed is going to be your baseboard, your casing, your framing, those kind of things. So for me, I will calculate the square feet of drywall. And then knowing how many times that I've hired somebody, I know what the square foot about price is, and it'll blow your mind. I paid like a lot for the last project. It's gone up crazy. It's about to go up more. It's just bananas. A sheet of drywall is like double what it was five years ago, and it blows my mind. But that's not the point. I use that as a guideline to, one, understand what I have to order, and then also understand the work that goes into uh, drywall or paint or any of that. For plumbing, electrical, I do not calculate how many linear feet of wire or drains. I call up the plumber and I get a quote from them. So I don't get too far into duct work. The HVAC, plumbing, electrical, I always sub out and I don't get into measuring for that stuff. I leave that to them. But I have an idea based on scope of work how many heat runs I have, how much it is per heat run, et cetera. So I use these things, the floor plan, the calculated material to help me for a phase that's later. For the two projects I'm working on now, these are people that I kind of know, I help them get their permit on their own. I am in Ontario, Canada. I know the rules for getting a permit here. I suggest you check out your local municipalities, building department, ask them what the permit requirements are. Here you need a floor plan, you need some details. It took like 10 minutes to have me run through how to make a uh, get a permit in Ontario, Canada. And I'll go through that on another video. Again, we've got a lot of work to do here. But this is part of your pre-construction process. You have a floor plan, right? That floor plan is going to help you get this permit because it has the details on it and the design. They want to know what you're building. Not in terms of color of paint or what kind of doors you're putting. Just square footage. Does it impact your property tax here in Ontario? Yes. It's not what you think it is. It's always retroactive. It's like four years. I talked to a friend at MPAC who did that. It's not quite as crazy as you think it is. What they do is if you don't have a basement and you submit the permit, eventually that makes its way to MPAC from your municipality. And then they will... Look at your neighborhood and see who has a finished basement. They'll see their property taxes and they'll match yours up to theirs. So, yes, taxes suck, but it is what it is. It's always better in my mind. And it's not a crazy amount. It's not like it's going to go up $100 a month. But it's important for me to know that it's done well and that this is all done legally. There are other ramifications when you go to sell your house kind of thing, but that's neither here nor there. That is not a concern just a point of information right now. Material delays are reality nowadays. So I like to, before we get started, send my clients a selection sheet. Made a video on this, as you know. And I think that's really important because if you have all that stuff lined up prior to your project starting, you will not run into unexpected lead time delays. Or if you do, you've done everything you can to avoid that. Right, So we're talking about picking your flooring, picking your trim, picking your doors, picking your door hardware, your vanity, your faucet, your paint color, all of that stuff so that when it comes time to get it, you know what it is and there isn't a lot of, I wonder what we're going to, nope, it's right here, it's all done, we can hit the ground running and if you have to make a change, you already have things in place, you can say, oh, well, we'll just swap this for this, done, cool. I think it's a big help. Again, this is a process of downloading all this stuff that's in your head, putting it into a file, and outsourcing it from your brain to create headspace. I always think of my brain as a box. There's only so much room in there. If I'm keeping track of paint colors, it's clogging up important RAM that I'm going to use to frame walls and install floors and all of that. So if I can get that out of my brain, I'm doing it makes for a better process. And if you're working with somebody who's your significant other or another contractor, having a floor plan, having a selection sheet, permit, all of this helps everyone along the way in the process. It's a very, very organized way to go. And that will help minimize or, or yeah, minimize your stress. It won't eliminate it, but it'll, it'll minimize it and make you feel like you're more in control of the project.
seeing the finish line is important or knowing how close or how far you are from it is really helpful. And so we try to make a schedule for every project. Try. I make a schedule for every project and I use Google Calendar to make a schedule. There's three elements that you're going to use in building any schedule. It's the subtask. So say subfloor, how long is that going to take? Three days. When am I going to start? The first of the month. Okay. So then you can go into Google Calendar and you can input each subtask and the start date. You can change the colors, you can move it around, make it fancy. You can also invite people. So for us, if I'm going to hire an electrician and I build the schedule, I will copy the electrician or give that electrician the calendar invite. So then they get a message saying, you've been invited to do electrical at this basement by so-and-so. Do not take for granted that because they've gotten a calendar invite, they've accepted that invite or that they are scheduled in. That's you asking. My recommendation is once you've asked them for a quote, which is the next step, before you go sending them that, call them and say, hey, I'm looking to do the project in this date. Are you available? Okay, I'm going to make a tentative tentative calendar because if things take too long, you're going to need to call them again and say, hey, look, I'm delayed a bit. We're going to need to push back. Can we reschedule? When are you available? What I like about Google Calendar is you can just click and drag that. You can go into your calendar, say you've got electrical for the third week of the month, and you're like, look, they're delayed. You can just move it to the fourth week of the month. And then you want to move every subsequent task after that back a week. But you can simply just click and drag. Okay? It just keeps you sane and organized. That's what it does. It doesn't take a lot of effort. It also, you can copy your significant other, whoever your partner is on this project, either to say, look, I want to do it this weekend. Can you handle the kids for a little bit so we can get this project moving? Or say you don't have kids and say, hey, what are your thoughts on us jumping in and doing the floor this weekend? Then they know, okay, we're doing it. Now you can plan for that. What I end up doing is, because I do it full time, I'm booking it by days. So if I think I'm going to install a floor, it's going to take three days. Great. You are probably doing this nights and weekends. So maybe you're stretching that a little bit more. You're thinking in terms of hours or in terms of a week. You know, say Tuesday night, you're going to go pick up the flooring. And then Wednesday night, you're going to organize the basement so you have space. And then... Thursday night, you're going to lay the underlay. And then Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, you're going to get started. And then you're going to have it done, okay? It doesn't have to be bang, bang, bang linear, but it just allows you to say, I've dedicated this time. Here's what I have to do. There's a notes section, too, I really like. So you can leave yourself notes and saying, hey, don't forget to pick up X, okay? Just, again, taking it out of your brain, putting it out into the world. I don't have to think about it. I can move on to the next task. Maybe this section should have been before and that's getting quotes or after. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. You're doing all of this together prior to construction and it all will be edited along the way. But if you're not going to do everything, if you're going to hire subcontractors, like I said, an electrician, a plumber, HVAC, maybe drywall, you want quotes from them. Now, if your basement is unfinished, there's nothing really for them to come look at. Ideally, I want them all to come look at it. But if you haven't framed your basement, the guy coming to do drywall, he's not going to have a lot to go on. What you can do is send them the floor plan and say, look, this is what I'm thinking about. Give them some details, ceiling heights, et cetera, maybe some pictures and say, can you give me an estimate? So then they'll give you a range. Okay, I think your drywall is going to be between 10000 and 12000 Okay, give me a call when framing's done. I'll come and have a look and we'll... We'll have a look at it and, and give you a more accurate price. So your floor plan is also designed to help you get quotes, not just permit, selection sheet, help you get quotes. I use the calendar now. All of that's connected. I'm along the way in my process. And with every step, I'm gaining a little bit more and more control and better understanding of what's going on. You're going to have back and forth. Each trade that's going to come in is going to ask you questions. You know, the plumber is going to go, do you want the tub here or here? Do you want a tub or a shower? Do you want a rain shower head? Do you want a slide bar? All of those are going to inform you along the way. And then you'll update your calendar, your selection sheet, your floor plan, whatever it is, 
as you go along to help you once you hit the ground running, once you've picked that, this is my go date, it'll go smoother. With everything put together, all the back end, the floor plan, the permit, the calculating materials, quotes, the schedule, the, all of that now done together, what I do is I provide the client or you know you, me, whatever, a budgetary guideline in contract details. What the budgetary guideline is is really I break down each task, subfloor framing, X, Y, Z, and I say, here's your estimated cost. Now, if I'm doing the subfloor and the framing, that cost is fixed. I don't have to guess. I know this is my materials. This is my labor. As long as nothing crazy happens, which in an unfinished basement of a house that's you know, built in 2000 or later, there's no unexpected or shouldn't be. It's all exposed. So those are fixed. However, when I'm hiring somebody else, especially nowadays with material and labor costs never being predictable, if I quoted a project that doesn't start for six months, that price needs to be updated for materials. So I say, look, your plumbing will be between 2500 and 3500 Your Electrical will be between 8000 and 9500 It all depends on what the decisions are made at that time. Are you okay to proceed with this? My fee is anywhere from 10 to 15% of whatever it is. So say the electrician's bill is 8000 I hand them the electrician's bill, and then they hand them my bill for 10% of what of whatever the electrician's bill was as a management fee. What does that management fee include? It includes all the things you don't see me doing. Meeting with the electrician, troubleshooting with them, fielding their phone calls, fielding your phone calls, going back and forth. It's a lot to take in that you don't see. Keeping it clean. So much of what I do is one trade is done. I go in, I check things out, make sure things are the way they're supposed to be. I clean up for the next trade. They come in. Why do I clean up? Why don't they clean up? They do, but not the same way I do because I want them to respect the site. I get it. Normal people should, but you're not in the trades. Just trust me on this. The management part is what makes or breaks a lot of this. It will separate every contractor. Okay. So that's what you're paying for. You're paying for my expertise. You're paying for my service. You're paying for my organization. You're paying for me being a business. Not me being some dude in a truck, which really right now I'm a dude in a dad wagon Dodge Caravan, which is neither here nor there. But that's what the management fee entails. It entails me going to the dump. It entails me protecting your uh, utility room, covering the doorways with plastic. All of those things you don't see that are cost, that's what that includes. You're paying for my relationship with the subs. I'm going to get better service, say, from my drywall guy than you are because I've been doing business with him for 10 years and I've given him hundreds of thousands of dollars of business and I will continue to. So he's more interested in keeping me happy and communicating with me and I have a relationship with him. So you're paying for that as well. So that's what the management fee is. I do not want, I don't have any overhead now. Prior to that, when I had a shop, employees, trucks, all of that, my markup was way higher, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50% because, you know, we're paying 5000 a month in rent. That's not being covered by just 10%, but I don't have that anymore. So my markup is lower. All of that goes towards transparency and understanding who you're hiring. You're hiring a company that has multiple trucks, that has multiple employees, that offers all of this. You're paying for that. They're not ripping you off. You're paying for that. Now, the service you're getting may not be as great as you'd like or the quality of work may not be as great as you like, but those things are built into the cost. So they are not ripping you off. It's just business. You don't go to the grocery store and renegotiate. So I want you to understand, at this point, I'm making my agreement, I've done all the legwork, and we're getting ready to go. We're signing the deal, I'm getting a deposit. Typically, my deposit is a marginal cost, it's to cover startup, 
And what I do is I will definitely typically invoice before we start a task and have a 10% hold back. But we've discussed that others. You want a contract or some type of written agreement that outlines your fee structure and payment schedule. If they're telling you like, yeah, I just do time and material. Okay. You don't need a deposit. Oh yeah, I need a deposit. How much? Oh, I don't know. Uh, like, no, you want all of this in writing in an email. They should be able to tell you these things before you, they even give you a cost. Like, do you take a deposit? Yes. How much is it? Typically 10 to 15% of the overall project or $2,000 or depends on what project is. They should be able to tell you that. Okay. So, but you're your own contractor. So you will t- be taking no deposit. The last step we have in our pre-construction process is going to be ordering materials. For things like subfloor, two by fours, drywall, those things, if I want them delivered, I'll go the week before and book my delivery time and then show up for the delivery, right? Those things are always readily available, but I wanna make sure. You know, the last project I had, they I needed 300 subfloor pieces, they only had 200. So I went the week before and they managed to get enough so that it was there in time and we we're all good and I didn't have to deal with any of it. Where you run into supply chain issues or back order issues is when you run into more specialty items. Your flooring, your vanity, your faucet, any glass work, you know, those kinds of things. You don't want to run into a scenario where you take for granted that it will be there and you show up to pick it up and they go, oh, by the way, it's eight weeks back ordered. You wanted to know that beforehand. So with your floor or any of those items, if you're putting a kitchen in your basement, the kitchen cabinets, you want to have these things lined up prior to getting started or at least have an understanding. So if they go, look, your vanity is going to be six weeks. And then you you want to follow up again and say, oh, six weeks. No, it's another two weeks delayed. So now you're at eight weeks. So whatever comes after your kitchen or your vanity, you, you want to adjust your trades around that. You don't want the plumber to show up with no vanity. And then he's going to make another trip and you're going to get another charge. Okay. So as much as delays are a reality, you want to have a grasp on when they're happening and adjust your schedule accordingly. Costs. Hey, this material went up. Like we're about to get a drywall increase of 10%. A sheet of drywall here in Ontario, Canada is $15.80 for a four foot by eight foot sheet. It's about to go up 10%. So a sheet of drywall will be over $17. So really ordering your materials, calculating all this stuff, you, the more control you have over it, the less overwhelming it will be. The more you tackle these details, when it comes time to doing the work, you will have taken all of this out of your brain, putting it out into the world, and you'll be able to execute your project more freely and comfortably than if you were sticking and keeping it all in your head and not doing it. I had a guy in my comments say, bro, just get to finishing. Okay, we'll get to that. But there is so much out there that people don't know and renovations are stressful and expensive and avoiding mistakes is important. People don't want to make mistakes because typically this is for their family. They have young kids. Money's tight. Inflation's killing us. Failing to plan is like planning to fail. We don't want your plan to suck. That being said, I want to thank you for stopping by. And good luck on your project.